Today, I'm going to share one of the verses that has shaped my attitude towards the work that God has called me to do. Uh, it is a verse from the book of Proverbs. And uh, when I started full-time ministry um, in the early 80s, I discovered that several attitudes shaped the way people who were called by God did the work of God. I was a young man at that time, and I noticed that people did not seem to focus on the work God had called them to do. They were not intentional about their work and their ministry. For example, uh, there were pastors who could travel for long periods of time, and they would leave their flock or the congregation unattended too. I also noted that a number of pastors felt that spontaneous speaking, speaking without preparation, was a sign that you were anointed by the Holy Spirit. So sermon preparation, especially among Pentecostals and Charismatics, was not done. You just stand, open your mouth, and trust God to fill your mouth with something, and normally what came out was not good. And then uh, a lot of pastors also uh, specialized at that time uh, from the late 70s uh, to the early 80s in, in what uh, was called blasting people. That means that the, 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 the strength of the pastor of his ministry was, was based on how much he can criticize people. So they spent time criticizing their members, their hairstyles, their, uh, their dress code, and, and basically being negative uh, against their members. Other pastors just allowed anyone who came to church or anyone who was in town to come and preach for them. And so sometimes a pastor would go to church on Sunday and just call somebody or some another guest pastor comes in and say, oh, can you please come and share? And the person would come and preach. So there didn't seem to be much seriousness uh, in the way people did ministry. Then there was, of course, this troubling situation of sexual immorality, which affected the reputation of quite a few people. And, and so when I grew up as a young pastor, uh, when I was growing up from the late 70s into the early 80s, uh, I observed these conditions and I was determined that God will help me not to repeat the mistakes I came to meet uh, and try to do right and do the right thing. And, and you know, Seeing the wrong thing and doing the right thing is always very difficult because the wrong thing can be so common and so established that the right thing will be foreign. And the passage I'm about to share with you between this week and next week was one verse that helped me to understand how to do the work that God has given to me. So I've titled my message, this is part one of it, I've titled it, How to Increase in What We Do. How to increase in what we do. No matter what we do, uh, what you do, what I do, what you do, uh, God wants us to increase in it. God wants us to grow it. God wants us to excel in it. God wants us to do it well. And so it's a two-part message. I'll start today and I'll finish next week. So my text is from Proverbs chapter 27. Uh, this passage has helped me a lot. Proverbs chapter 27 from verse 23 to 27. Proverbs 27, 23 to 27. And it says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your heads, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maid servants. I'm sure you're wondering, how could such a verse help you? So I'm going to explain what I've learned from this verse and what it means to us. Now you have to understand 
that the Bible was written within a certain uh, age or a certain culture. Uh, and this would be thousands of years removed from our world. So sometimes it's important to pay attention and try to bring the meaning to our present day. In the Old Testament days, the wealth of people who lived in the Palestinian era or the area consisted of their livestock, the animals they reared. And if a person managed his livestock well, then they will become more prominent in society. So for us to learn from this, we have to understand what the livestock means. So if you read the passage, it says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. That's verse 23. So what is flocks and herds? It represents what we have to make us productive. For the person living at that time, their flocks and their herds are the animals they had which they would use to make their lives productive. Flocks refers to sheep and goats. Uh, and, and herds will refer to any other animal. Sometimes it, re it refers to uh, cattle uh, and, and other an animals. So basically flocks and herds were the animals that the people read. Flocks and herds then will be like stocks today. The stocks that people trade in in the stock exchange. It is wealth that you use or you trade in in order to make your life very good. Now, of course, most of us today, we don't uh, have flocks and herds. I, I, I don't know how many of you own uh, a goat or own sheep or own cattle or own some other maybe camels. Uh, uh, you may have goat and, and cattle. I, I wonder whether anybody owns camels in this church. Anybody owns camels? Any camel owner? All right. How many of you rear goats? How many of you own goats? Okay, a few people here. I used to. And I used to have cattle. I have a few. Uh, how many of you have cattle? Cows? Okay. How many of you have squirrels? <laughs> All right. So, so here we have... Uh, the flocks and herds and represent what we have to make us productive. So today when we talk about flocks and herds, it doesn't mean much to us because we don't own flocks and herds. So we have to take the principle and bring it down to where we are today. So I'm applying this principle to our day-to-day -day work. So the flocks and herds represent three things. First, it represents what we do, what we do, our vocation. Your vocation is your flock and is your herd. Your vocation is the thing that occupies your time and your attention. My vocation is that of a pastor. That's my vocation. Your vocation may be a soldier, a teacher, uh, a nurse, a doctor, a mechanic, a, a dressmaker, a tailor, that's your vocation. It's what you do. So, my work as a pastor, your work as a tailor, is similar to a man in that era who owned flocks and herds. Because that is what you're going to use to produce what you want. So, first, it represents our vocation, what we do. Secondly, the flocks and herds there can be applied to where we work, our company. Our company is the organization we work for. We may work for an organization we started or an organization that somebody else started. So think of it. Your workplace is your flock and your herds. is your treasure. It's your stock and you need to value it. Now sometimes I get the impression that people do not see the link between the company they work for and the kind of life they live, especially if they don't own the company. Um, many of us hate the place we work. It's one of the things I've come to note uh, in our 
part of the world. People hate the place they work. You go to a shop and there are shop assistants and their salary is paid from how well the shop functions. But if you are a customer coming, they start talking down their shop. Sometimes they actually want to teach you how to cheat their company. And sometimes they want to direct you to somewhere else. And the people forget that if this company goes down, I go down. Somehow we think the company is very different from our lives. But I want you to think of the place you work for as your, as your stock, as your heads, and as your flock. It's your head, your work, your vocation is your head and flock. Your company is your head and flock. And the third thing that is your head and flock is your reputation. How others see us. Our reputation is our flock, is our head, is our goat, is our cattle. So if you always re deliver results, people will trust you with what is important to them and reward you accordingly. So now when I got into ministry, I, I wasn't a cattle rarer. I didn't have goats. All I had was my vocation, the calling that God has given to me. That's all I had. And I had the church that God had allowed me to start. That was my company. That's all I had. That's my flock and, and my reputation. How others will see me. If people thought I was a bad pastor, they wouldn't come to my church. If they thought I was lazy, they wouldn't come and listen to me. If they thought I didn't take time to prepare what I was going to say, they wouldn't value what I said. So this is all I had. This is my flock and my head. And for you, that is also all you have. These are your flocks and your head. Your vocation, your company, your reputation. The company may not be yours. It may belong to somebody. But if it goes down, you're going down with it. And in these days where it's very difficult to get a job, you must thank God when somebody employs you. I'm telling you, if somebody employs you, you must every day in the morning kneel down and thank God for the person. Because if that person or that company has no capacity to employ you any longer, you are in big trouble. You are in big trouble. Anybody who, has, who is able to pay you every month deserves your full-time prayer. I'm telling you that. Don't take it for granted that you get up in the morning, you say, my, 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 my salary is not enough. That's not what I'm talking about. You, what is not enough if you don't have it? You don't even have something to say it is not enough. So don't use it is not enough to destroy the company that allows you to have what you consider not enough. All right? So that's all you have. Your vocation, company, reputation. That's how I saw my calling. That this is all I have. And for me, it was very significant because of my history and what, what, where I was coming from and the situation of my life. And I, I just thank God that I have a calling. That he has allowed me to start a church. It's meeting in a classroom, but that's all I have. There was no electricity in the classroom, but that's all I have. Just a few people, that's all I have. That's my flock. Those are my heads. And if I took good care of that, then God will give me something significant. So what does the passage say we should do with our flocks and heads? What should we do with them? So we, I will read the verse again, and then we'll, I'll tell you what the passage says we should do. It says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your heads. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your head. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your head. What is it saying? First, it says know the state of your flock. Know their state. It means to notice, to listen, to learn. 
to pay close attention to them. The Hebrew word used there is yada. Yada is to know something experientially. To know something experientially. It's not sitting afar to know information. It's getting down there to know it for yourself. Having first-hand experiential knowledge about your vocation, your company, reputation, your flocks, and your stock, and your heads. Now, in this particular verse, the word yada and the way it is used is very interesting. It means to be aware of the voices and the faces of your flock. Be aware of the voices and the faces of your flock. Can you imagine you are a shepherd in those days? And the passage says if you're going to do well, you must not just know your flock, but be aware of their voice and faces. How, how can a shepherd know the voice and the faces of his sheep? Because for, as far as I know, all sheep look the same. Don't you think so? Except if the color is, is different. If it's black, I'll say that's a black sheep. It's white, that's a white one. That's, it's black and white, that's a black and white one. But the passage doesn't even talk about their color. It talks about their face and their voice. So the passage is saying when your goat bleeds, meh. And then today, uh, next day, it says, meh. You should tell the difference between meh and meh. And be able to tell what is happening to your flock. That's what it's saying. Pay attention to their voice. Pay attention to their face. In other words, the goat will not look the same to you. Each one must be known. You must know each one. Pay attention to them. That's what the flock said. And that's what advised me when I started as a pastor. I had a small church. Meeting in a small classroom. We didn't have electricity in that classroom. We didn't have drums. We didn't have equipment. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a sponsor. We didn't have money. And nobody in the church had a car. Including the pastor. How am I going to take care of this flock? The passage says. Pay attention. Know them. Know them intimately. You cannot sit, fold your legs, fold your arms, issue instructions, and think things will work. You have to have experiential knowledge. So, this proverb tells us that we must notice, we must listen, and we must learn if we want to improve our vocation our place of work or our reputation. How well do you know your work? How well do you know the place you work for? How well do you know the people you serve? Know them well. Then the second thing it says is that attend to them. Attend to them. It means to be always ready to serve. Be always ready to serve. Always ready to serve. You have to correct that. Always ready to serve. The, the, the Hebrew word that is used there means to stand at attention, ready to go to work. He says that's how you should attend to your head. Stand at attention, ready to work. Interesting. It means you cannot be passive and casual about what you do. The closest situation I can apply this to is, is to a doctor who is on call. A doctor on call for all of you doctors, God bless you. And nurses. Somebody said, what about my work? I'm, your work too, God bless you. But I'm talking about doctors and nurses. A doctor 
on call. It, it's, it's one of those things that is so fascinating. I remember when my wife used to get pregnant. <laughs> We've come out of that trade a long time ago, but when we used to be in the trade, and, and you know, and she gets pregnant, and especially when, it, when it's getting to delivery time, and we will talk to uh, the doctor, her doctor, and, and, and usually the, if it's about within the week or so, the doctor will say, listen, in those days there was no cell phone. And they will say, any time of the night, if so and so happens, call me. That's landline call. Any time of the night. And if you, if you don't even call, come. Can you imagine? I mean, though, now you have phone and somebody can give you notice I'm coming. But those days, you just pop in. And the doctor will say, any time, any time. And it's, it, it used to fascinate me. And I, rem I know that I, I know our doctor at that time. He was a young man, almost like me, slightly older than myself. Young family, had a wife and children. Just like everybody wants to sleep, he also wants to sleep. Everybody gets tired. He also gets tired. His family needs him. His wife needs him. His children need him. But he says, at this point, you are my flock. And I stand ready to my own inconvenience to serve you. That is what the proverb writer had. Attend to your flock means stand ready at any time, morning, noon, and night to take care of the flock. No excuses. Take your work seriously. Of course, when the doctor tells you you can call any time, please don't take advantage of that and call him. Say, oh, I was just watching this on TV. What do you think? Please, that's not what this is. This is for emergency. And most times you may never have to make that call. But just to show you, it's a mindset that the doctor has. And there are a few other professionals who have that same mindset who would say, I'm working on this project for you. Call me 24-7. Now, there are people who say, call me 24-7, and you call them, one, nothing. Two, nothing. Three, nothing. 24, nothing. Not to even talk about seven. <laughs> call me anytime. You never get him. Line is always engaged or you leave messages and leave messages and leave WhatsApp and they told you, call me anytime. If that's how you are managing your work, we will learn later. You're not going to do well. And it will not be the devil. It will not be demons. It will not be your grandmother. It will not be a curse. It will not even be that the nation is hard. It simply means you didn't Apply yourself. You know, I, when I started ICGC, it was during the hardest time in Ghana. Those of you who are old enough to, to know. Those days we had uh, chains that were attributed to our, our president at that time. People were growing lean. People were emaciated. We were eating yellow corn. We, I mean, people would go to queue for corn before it is cooked. We were having our bath with some miserable soap. Corrosive. The stores were empty. Shelves were empty. That is the situation I was called to. You can't even talk to your members about giving. Because you look at their face. And you hear they are bleating, man. And you know, this one, I can't tell him to give. <laughs> they say, time for giving, man, man. They are crying. You can't even tell them to give. All you have to do is pour your heart and pour your heart and pour your heart and pour your heart and pour your heart. Because it's not reward time.
attend to them. And why does the passage say we should care for our flocks? Why did it say that? I want to read the verse again. It says, be, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your heads. For, for means because, because. This is the because. There, there's a place in Abeka called Abeka because. Because. <laughs> because why should we attend to the flock because riches are not forever nor does a crown endure to all generations why are we supposed to pay attention to the flock and to the herds because money can easily be wasted that's why Money can easily be wasted. As good as money is, it can easily be lost. When you seek for money without diligently working for it, you will waste it. I can guarantee you. Any money we make that didn't, we did not earn will be easily wasted. It's the reason why thieves continue stealing till they are caught. Because they go and take people's labor and they don't go and invest it. They steal the money and overnight blow it. They have to go the next night to go and steal again. Because when you don't earn something, you waste it. Anybody who sweats for their money doesn't waste money. People who make money easily waste their money. And you can apply it in many ways. Anytime you see somebody frivolously using money, wastefully using money, they are earning the money in an easy way. Because if you earn it and it's your blood, you won't go and buy things with it that you don't need. So, the passage says money can easily be wasted. So, although we all need money, although we want money, that should not be our focus. If you pursue the money and never pursue work, whatever money you have will be wasted. But if you pursue work and labor, whatever money you have will be invested. Money can be easily noticed, uh, uh, easily wasted. Secondly, it says the crown, it's not forever. What does that mean? It means position and privilege are not enduring. Crown refers to high position, privileges. If you are looking for crown, You'll be disappointed in life. You know, when I started this church, right from the beginning, I was called senior pastor. And the reason was very practical because there were other pastors with me. Our church was small, but we had a couple of other people who were pastors. And to distinguish the pastors, I was called the senior pastor and the others were the pastors. And then when I became, and when we started planting churches a few years down the line, I was called a general overseer because I was overseeing churches. It's not a title, a crown to aspire to. My position as senior pastor is secure. I've been in this position for 38 years. I've never been promoted. 
Same title for 38 years. There's nothing like senior, senior pastor or chief senior pastor or major senior pastor. No promotion, same thing. 38 years. General Vasia, probably about 35 or so years. No promotion. That should make me then say, well, I have the pos position. But I, my mindset, which I've had all these years, is that although I'm not interviewed for my job and nobody determines my promotion, I must justify my inclusion. I must justify. So every day, when I stand here, every Sunday when I am preaching here, I am on trial. I am on trial. If I don't do well, you will leave. You follow what I'm saying? I cannot say, well, I've been a successful pastor for 38 years, so the people, of course, must come here. Yes, they, 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 they must appreciate what I've done for 35, uh, 38 years. But that is not guaranteed. The only guarantee is I must take care of my vocation so that when I stand here, I will be given another week. If you like this video and you want more content like this, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also like the video, share to others so that they can be blessed. Thank you and see you in the next video.